Hello, everybody, and good evening. Welcome to the end of day 13 of the 2022 Milwaukee Film Festival presented by Associated Bank. Um, also this year, all of our off-screen or I guess off the big screen events, uh, whether they are parties or panels or anything in between, are presented by the Yubuki Family Foundation. So a huge thanks to them for all of the work that has happened throughout the fest. Uh, my name is Molly Vey. My pronouns are they, she and I am the Artist Services Manager at Milwaukee Film. Um, and I also have the honor and joy of moderating tonight's panel, Reproductive Rights and Access to Care Through the Lens of the Ape, which is presented by Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. So I am going to bring forth um, all of our lovely, incredible folks who are joining us this evening and have them introduce themselves briefly. Um, Samantha, do you want to introduce yourself first? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Herndon. I am the communications manager for UW Core, which is the Collaborative for Reproductive Equity at University of Wisconsin Madison. I'll be sharing some of what we work on at Core tonight, but also want to note that I'll be taking off my uh, state government employee hat a little bit and sharing some personal views given the momentous news going on today. Awesome. Uh, Vanessa. Good evening. My name is Vanessa Johnson. I am a reproductive health OB nurse in a community and also the owner of Miracle Happen Wellness and Birth Services, where I serve as a doula birth worker in the community and a prenatal yoga instructor. And the goal, again, is to bridge the caps between the medical and emotional models of care, perinatal care. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Lisa, do you want to go? Sure. So I'm State Representative Lisa Subak. I represent part of the city of Madison and the state legislature. I also serve um, on the health committee and worked previously prior to my time in the legislature in the women's health policy world. And certainly it has been a cornerstone of my work in the legislature as well. Awesome. And last but not least, Tanya, would you like to go? Hi, I'm Tanya Atkinson. I'm president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin, and we are the state's largest nonprofit reproductive health care provider. Awesome. Well, first off, thank you all for coming. This is an incredible slate of folks. Um, and we, you know, we've been talking about this panel for a little while now, and we knew it would be timely, but I think we maybe didn't know quite how timely it would be, um, for better or worse. So I would love to just get us started by having all of you give a little um, anecdote, I guess, of how you got into this work, like how you started in this work. I guess I can I can um, I can go ahead and start. Um, I've I've been with Planned Parenthood for. Um, ooh, about 18 years now, and I've been in the role for about five um, and. Um, you know, I, I, I got into this work um, originally. I'm a social worker by um, by training, and um, and I was uh, working in macro practice and public policy. So I was um, volunteering on the board of Planned Parenthood Advocates of Wisconsin and um, uh, doing you know economic justice work, um, and uh, had the opportunity to come on board at Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. And um, the the reason um, that I, I have stayed in this field for so long and, and particularly at Planned Parenthood, Wisconsin, is I grew up in a um, small rural um, town in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, so my shout out to the Driftless folks um, listening in. Um, and uh, I grew up in a dairy farm. And, you know, as with a lot of um, farm families, access to health care can be very challenging. Um, and accessing insurance can be very challenging. And my Parents went to really great lengths um, to ensure that we had access to healthcare and ensure that we had access to insurance. Um, working multiple jobs, you know, on the farm and then off the farm, um, so that we had employer-sponsored insurance when we can. And and um, and you know, sometimes those those medical bills could be devastating. So I, I came I came to the movement, you know, through public policy and advocacy, um, and and really, you know, in ref in reflection. Um, 
I know, you know, what it's like to struggle to access healthcare, and I know um, how devastating that can be for families. And so, to be able to to be with an organization and a movement um, to ensure that that everybody has access to healthcare um, that they need, and in particular, to be a part of um, accessing reproductive and sexual health care, which can have such a huge impact on the trajectory of a person's life. Um, it's it's just been it's been an incredible honor. So um, so that's that's sort of how I got here, um, and and why I am um, still very proud to be um, a part of this community. I, I can go next if you'd like. Um, so I actually um, started my career in early childhood education and then moved sort of into social services. I worked with the Head Start and early Head Start programs where I was working with young children, families, and then with um, parents from the time they were pregnant through um, the time their child was three. And through that work, I began working a lot with homeless families and ended up moving more into the social service sphere, worked with um, Homeless, homeless and home, people who were homeless are at risk of homelessness, largely women or women with children, and pretty quickly began to see some of the inequities in the healthcare sphere, um, particularly as they tried to access reproductive health care, and especially as they tried to access abortion services. Um, there were things that I think I had never known when I began that work that I learned through going through it side by side with the families who I was working with about the struggles that they had to access services, whether it be because they had to take days off work or because they couldn't afford the cost. And I sort of ended up where I am now because one at a time I was helping families access you know, whether it was reproductive health care or other services, um, can help somebody, you know, work through the abortion funds, come up with the money for an abortion, help somebody work through the hoops to get onto Medicaid or to get other services they needed. At the end of the day, I was doing the same thing with the next family and the same thing with the next family and really began to see how broken the system was. And that drove me to want to change those systems. It really made me realize that helping one family at a time overcome barriers and a broken system wasn't good enough. We had to fix the broken system. And that's really what drove me into the world of policy in general, and then specifically um, reproductive health policy. And what drove me then, I guess, you know, you're on the other side of the table long enough and you think, you know, my voice should really be on <laughs> the decision-making side, which is really what then drove me to run for public office. All right, so how did I get into this work? Um, really, you know, as a doula birth worker with the families that I serve, it's really about, really about creating an experience for their perinatal journey that is positive and memorable in a, in a positive way. Most women um, that I come in contact with um, do not have positive experiences. And you always tell the families that they never forget their birth story. So my journey started with my mother. She was visiting Milwaukee, Wisconsin, living in Indiana, and she was here for the 4th of July weekend. She was not due with me until September. And so she came to Milwaukee. She had family here. And again, visiting the 4th of July weekend, I was born July 6th. And she went into labor. And she went into a hospital setting. They did not believe that she was in labor. They were not listening to her concerns. Just told her she was constipated. And they told my father that he can go back to Indiana because my mother was not in labor. And so she sat in a room by herself. No one really attended to her. She kept trying to call family and say, hey, can someone come, come visit me? I'm here by myself. I really feel that I'm in labor. And they, again, the medical professionals continued to tell her, no, you're not in labor. You're just constipated. By the time the physician got there hours later, over five hours later, I was crowning. Um, I was born two pounds, two ounces, and within 15 minutes of having me, again, in an environment that um, was not familiar, she had no baby bag, she had no support, she had no spouse with her, she wrote a poem. 
and it started with a miracle happened late last night. Vanessa Denise Johnson was born full of fight and it, it goes on and on. And so that's where I get the business name from a miracle happened. Um, but I really feel like my mother set the intention for my, my plight and my, my journey in this work in that moment, um, because who would have known years later, um, I was a young mom, I was a teen mom, and I really was intentional about owning that 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 title of mother. And so I can recall, recall going to different mommy and me sessions where I'm sitting in circles and I'm the only young black mom, I'm the only black mom, I'm the only single mom, um, and there was no one that looked like me. I can remember going to um, breastfeeding organization meetings and trying to get support with breastfeeding as a teen mom. And again, I was the only single mom, the only black mom, the only um, one that looked like me. And it was it was um, an environment that didn't feel comfortable or supported. And so I can recall at that time thinking that, you know, I would I would go into a field where I can be that representation, that support for other families, other young moms. Um, and so even before I went to nursing school, I had become a certified a lactation educator, um, went on to nursing school and um, wanted to work in mom and baby, of course, and our instructor got sick. And so I did not have my OB rotation and I was devastated. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what I planned for. This is what I worked hard for. And then fast forward, you know, over, over 10 years in my nursing career, I came across the word doula. And I'm like, hey, what is this? I went to an informational and I was hooked ever since. And really, you know, I feel like it's just really come full circle. Well, now I'm in the birthing room with families, um, helping bring their babies earthside and offering prenatal education. Now as a, as a, you know, reproductive health nurse, I can bring that expertise from that, that standpoint, but also bringing in that emotional connection that I didn't get. I didn't have a doula. I didn't know about birthing balls or prenatal yoga or anything like that. And so, um, but I remember my birth story. My mother remembers hers very vividly. And so if I can just bring an inkling of whatever my mom felt in that moment of peace to to write a poem, um, that that that's you know all I'm 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 here for. And um and so that's kind of kind of my story and how I've I've been connected really since since birth. Wow. Um, my story is is not as in depth, and, but I have a similar passion for um, reproductive equity and making sure that people have the um, experiences and health access that they need and deserve. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a big hub for reproductive justice, and I was really fortunate to learn about that framework from a young age. And um, working with Girl Scouts Beyond Bars for girls who have incarcerated parents and volunteering with a rape crisis center really informed my understanding of the different levels of access that we have um, to reproductive health. So it's something that I'm very passionate about. And um, as a communications professional, I'm really interested in the way that um, advocates, and in this case, the Irish activists, um, really use values-based messaging and non-stigmatizing messaging to work on expanding access. So I'm excited to um, implement some of what I've learned from the folks who worked on the 8th and to discuss it with you all tonight. Awesome, awesome. I love hearing, I just love hearing how people get to the spaces where they're in. So thank you for that. I think that context is really helpful too, as we sort of charge forward, talking about not only the film The Eighth, which for anybody here or watching who hasn't seen is still available virtually on the Milwaukee Film Platform, um, and really dives into the referendum of repealing the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. Um, and legalizing is my generic term for what we're going to run with for this tonight, but legalizing abortion in Ireland. And it really follows the works of these grassroots organizers who are doing that work. Um, and I, we had a Dean Kane, one of the directors and producers in town um, last weekend, and she said a couple of things that really stuck with me that seemed really timely about the resonance of the work that they were doing in Ireland and the work that we're seeing here and the shifting mentality that we're seeing here. And that I think is very hard to ignore as we are in this room right now or this virtual room right now. Um, and so I am just gonna throw us right into the deep end of this pool right, right now, trying to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Um, but with this leaked document um, and with this idea of, 
of seeing where the Supreme Court may be going with Roe v. Wade. What does this look like for the United States broadly, but I think specifically for folks in Wisconsin and the people who are here who can have children and who don't want to for whatever reason? I can I can jump in if that's um, um, so. Uh, the the leaked document and 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 I think we, um, you know, it, it is important first to say that this is a leaked draft and so abortion is still legal in the state of Wisconsin, um, and Roe has not yet been overturned. Um, that being said, I think we need to believe people when they show us who they are, um, and. Um, and so in the state of Wisconsin, we have uh, a over 170 year old abortion ban on our books that wasn't being enforced because of Roe. So if, if as the draft indicates, Roe is completely overturned and in America, we lose the constitutional right to an abortion, that means abortion would immediately become a crime in the state of Wisconsin, um, unless the legislature, um, uh, would repeal our criminal abortion ban as Representative Subek um, has been fighting for so, so long um, to get our legislature to do that, uh, it, it, seems, it seems unlikely. So we have approximately 1.3 million women and, and those are the, that statistic is specifically um, in the binary, so I'm referencing it in the binary, 1.3 million women of reproductive age um, in the state of Wisconsin. And so that is, that is that is a potential impact, and we know, um, and we know that it will have a disproportionate impact on um, marginalized communities and communities that are already experiencing some of the most significant health inequities in the entire nation. Um, as we look at as we look at health inequities in Wisconsin, so you know, deciding when and if to become a parent can be the most life changing decision a person can make, and. Um, what we're seeing from that leaked document is nothing short of devastating for the state of Wisconsin. Any other thoughts or additions that people want to throw in? Um, I'll just add that I think Tanya summed it up quite well. Um, the sense of urgency was already very real, I think, for many of us. But um, what we saw last night makes it all the more urgent um, that we stand up and really fight for our basic freedom. And it really is our basic freedom that's at stake here. If we can't make those decisions about when and if we become a parent, how can we live freely? And so it is such an urgent issue. Unfortunately, here in the state of Wisconsin, um, at times where we might have had an opportunity to overturn that ban, the sense of urgency wasn't there for some folks. And unfortunately, that kept the state from doing what we really should have done. Um, and now we're at a point where legislatively, the makeup of the legislature is such that um, they won't even take up the issue. We can't even get a hearing on it. Um, there is absolutely no movement whatsoever. I do think there's an opportunity at the federal level to um, continue to try to move forward the Women's Health Protection Act. And that too could help protect um, Wisconsin families um, by legalizing abortion at the federal level. And I think that that is an important route. That doesn't mean we give up the fight here in Wisconsin, but I think we need to realize that we need to start changing who's occupying the seats in the legislature and ensure that the folks who are occupying those seats share our values um, if we are ever going to be able to actually pass the Abortion Rights Preservation Act, which is the baseline on should you have the right to access safe and legal abortion, should abortion be safe and legal in Wisconsin. It doesn't reverse any of the other rollbacks that have been made in access to abortion care, and that's a whole other issue, um, but it is the baseline of should abortion remain safe and legal here in our state, and we need to move forward on that, but it's going to take a shift in who's in the legislature. 
And so I work with, again, I work at a, a health clinic in the, in the reproductive health um, OB department and cl uh, clinic. And, you know, my colleagues and I were discussing this issue um, and the urgency, like the word urgency is, is definitely loud and clear. Uh, one of my colleagues today, and I quote, said, you don't, you don't ban abortions. You can't, you'll never be able to ban abortions. Um, you're banning, you're banning safe abortions. And when we talk about, you know, backyard abortions or um, those type of things, you know, it doesn't affect the wealthy who can travel to have these safe ab abortions. It, 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 again, disproportionately impacts, like you said, people of color, marginalized people who have already had so many you know, various struggles, you know, and that just compounded concern of not having a choice will be huge. You know, for those of us who work in the field directly, when you have, you know, young moms or when we have 14 year old um, um, teens come in the clinic who are um, pregnant due to rape or something like that, or if we, um, you know, we have families come in with their babies wrapped in towels, they have no way to, to purchase items for their baby. And, you know, luckily at our clinic, we do have um, the Storks Nest programs that was founded with uh, by Zeta Phi Beta Sorority and March of Dimes collaboration that, you know, if it's an incentive program where people who, who go through the program, they can earn points and then they can use those points to shop in our Storks Nest, which houses baby items that when we see uh, families come in who don't have the, the things that they need, we can offer that to them. But not every every location has a Storks Nest um, but it's it's real out here and people are struggling in my doula work. You know, I've worked with pregnant teens and living in group homes and, you know, they'll tell me, hey, I don't have food. You know, I've gone out in the in grocery shop for for families. And, you know, so taking that choice away for people who, again, with so many different um, negative impacts going on in their life or negative components when we talk about social determinants of health and how all that plays in, to, in part in just being able to safely not only um, prepare for, for birth, you know, ideally we want people to prepare to um, give birth. Um, that is just not something that is feasible for a lot of people. And so taking that choice away from, from people will be devastating, will be absolutely devastating. We have patients now who, you know, they come in for their pregnancy test and they're like, I cannot, I, I will not. And do you have resources for me? And to not be able to share those resources, it, it will be devastating. For those of us who have been following the Supreme Court's um, actions over the past year, it's unfortunately not totally surprising to see that they are planning to likely gut Roe versus Wade. And yet it's still, um, it's still for myself, it hits me in a way that just is, um, it, it hurts. And it hurts to feel like women are not valued, people with uteruses are not valued. But um, there are a few silver linings. So, or not silver linings, I don't mean to minimize the severity of this. One piece of potential good news here in Wisconsin is that the current attorney general, Josh Call, has said that he will not direct any state resources toward prosecuting people for obtaining abortions or providing abortions. Um, he is up for re-election. So as others have said, we'll need to pay attention to those races. Um, and we do live in a, a region where if abortion is made illegal here in Wisconsin, people could travel to nearby states, including Illinois and Minnesota, which is obviously not an ideal solution, but it is unlike other states where there is a true abortion desert, no states nearby whatsoever, where someone could access safe and legal abortion. And um, medication abortion, which is already accounting for the majority of abortions in the United States, over 50% in the last year, is likely to become more and more common and people can find out more about that and order pills through resources such as Plan C pills and aid access. So I think those are some pieces of information to be aware of, as well as making sure people know what is available to them in terms of contraception and emergency contraception. So I am gonna pull from what a handful of you have said and something that, again, we had the um, director or one of the directors and producers in town of the film, The Eighth. And one of her biggest takeaways is that at the end of this film, you think that they have won. 
And that in all actuality, just legalizing abortion to what many of you said does not mean that we have ex accessible or affordable abortion access or or just healthcare access for folks. And so who have resources that you have not shared yet or who can talk to like, what is that to um, how people can find spaces where they can be supported in making decisions and also in finding affordable access. Hopefully that came out right. <laughs> So I, I think, um, and I don't always mean to go first. So so if anybody else, um, I, I'm my edit. So so please, anybody else can can jump in first. I'm not trying to um, take up too much space in our virtual room here. Um, so so that is correct. We have 72 counties in the state of Wisconsin, and only um, three counties um, have uh, have abortion providers in those counties. And so for a very long time. Wisconsin has had uh, a very um, uh, challenged uh, access system. We have people traveling from as far as the UP to Madison and Milwaukee to access um, to access abortion, and um, and and I think from a um, from an informational perspective, it is important to know that that Planned Parenthood doesn't turn anyone away, and we do have um, we do have uh, justice funds available. For people who may need um, access to abortion and may not have the resources, and that does include people who need resources for travel or for lodging. So we we do want to make sure that people um, are are aware of that. Um, and at the same time, um, we are a large state with only three counties that have that have an abortion provider. Um, and and um, and and so I'm, I I I think that's sort of the the part of the question. I think others are much more. Um, uh, well poised to, you know, to talk about some of the other, um, some of the other pieces of your question. I can add three additional resources for um, finding abortion care as well as post-abortion support. And those are um, the website INeedAnA.com. I need an A uh, is an abortion provider locator and can um, help find a provider who's going to be within the limits in your, your area. The National Network of Abortion Funds can provide funding. Um, we also have the Wisconsin Women's Medical Fund and Options Fund, as well as Midwest Ac Access Coalition. And um, Exhale Pro Voice can provide uh, phone or text counseling. Uh, before or after an abortion. So those might be some helpful resources for folks to share. I, I think one thing that that um, as we're looking at the very likelihood that Roe is going to be completely um, overturned and abortion will be illegal in the state of Wisconsin, um, that that is it is important for um, for us all to work together and and um, as we're working with you know people in communities, um, to ensure that people understand that they can receive, people who need an abortion can receive a lot of their care, um, their their pre-care at, at a Planned Parenthood. Um, and then we'll make sure that people get safely um, to a state where they trust people to make their own healthcare decisions. Um, and, then, and then Planned Parenthood could be there for, for their aftercare. And I say that because as we're looking at Texas and we're seeing the fallout of Texas, um, um, the states around us, like Illinois and Minnesota, and Illinois in particular, um, the waits are going to be very, very long. Um, they are already long, and time is of the essence. And so the more that we can all work together um, in Wisconsin to ensure that people, people who need an abortion can get as much care as they need, whether it's at Planned Parenthood or whether it's somewhere else, get as much of, of that care as they need, um, um, you know, in their own backyard, um, the the more accessible it's going to be to have the actual um, procedure or um, medication uh, handed to them um, when they're in Illinois or Minnesota, for example. Um, what we're seeing um, from Texas is um, surrounding states, extremely, extremely long wait times, very difficult for people to 
find an appointment. Um, and and so you know, as a as a community, um, working together to you know to ensure that we make this as seamless as possible for the people of Wisconsin who need an abortion. Um, I'll just pipe up and say thank you to Planned Parenthood because one of the things that I know I've been thinking a lot about and others have been thinking a lot about is how the need for resources changes um, in this changing landscape and who's there to do that, who can help build, um, whether it's funds, whether it's the actual support for individuals who are going out to seek abortions, whether it's that care that you can provide in state before and after and in navigating that system, it is Planned Parenthood who is stepping up to do that. And they are uniquely positioned to be able to do that. And you know, I think, thank goodness for Planned Parenthood, I've sat in a legislature where they are regularly bashed by lawmakers and lawmakers do everything they can to chip away at the resources Planned Parenthood has. And I know they count on folks like us to continue to support them in order to be able to do this critical work, but we support them so they can support us. And I just, I think listening to Tanya here reinforces what I think I already know, which is what an incredible asset Planned Parenthood is to our community and just how much more vital um, than ever before they become in a scenario like this. So thank you. I want to speak a little bit about um, access in general. Um, in Wisconsin, we do, or in Milwaukee, we do have what we call um, FQHCs, federally qualified um, health centers. And they're nonprofit health centers that receive funding to support families, um, community based health care centers. Um, and they, a lot of them are really um, intentional about providing the medical home experience where you can have your family in internal medicine practice, you can have your reproductive health OB practice, your dental care, your radiology, your uh, PEDS, pediatrics, your behavioral health, um, all under one umbrella. So when we think about, again, social determinants of health and access, you know, they can have those appointments all under one roof, um, really connecting with uh, providers who are really passionate about this work and service um, because they can go to the larger health entities and make a lot more money and have a lot more flexibility, a um, lot more low risk. A lot of the, the FQHCs in our community are serving them the highest risk uh, populations and um, with, with the least amount of support in the, the women's health clinic that I work for, um, we had been using a an ultrasound machine that couldn't even take pictures for, for quite some time. And, and so, you know, they really um, need additional support and advocacy on the, on the legislative end um, as well. But um, the providers that I work with are amazing. And they're, they're, again, they're very intentional. I don't know any place that you can go where you can come if you're an hour late for your appointment or two hours late. It's really about, we need you seen. If you can show up, when can you show up? Um, because we, we know that you have all these other things going on that you're trying to manage and we want to make it as easy as possible. And so I know for myself, when I go to doctor's appointment, if I'm 15 minutes, like that's it, you're rescheduling, it's over, right? Um, but you have to kind of switch the dynamic of thinking when you come, when it comes to healthcare and this this type of service, um, I call it heart work, because you, you really need to be flexible and think outside the box to provide access. And a lot of other large organizations just aren't Aren't, are willing or aren't able. And so um, having families find um, or individuals find the fellow federally qualified health centers in there and clinics in their city, I think will make a huge different difference. And we can have those hard conversations if you're, you know, you're pregnant and you don't know what to do and you're thinking that, you know, you don't want to proceed with the pregnancy. Let's sit down and talk about it. You know, what are your options? You know, what are your whys? Um, and we take that extra time in our clinic to, to, to talk. Sometimes, you know, our providers are in the rooms for 30, 45 minutes to an hour. And that's, you know, because, you know, we have and we bring in the behavioral health and the social workers right then and there in that moment. You don't have to reschedule another appointment. It's already infused into that experience. And so. Um, that would be my 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 suggestion, and I'm an advocate for the, the FQHCs in our in our city, and they definitely need more support. Yep, I I agree, and um, and we have a, a 
you know, partnership with, um, with you know, a lot of Progressive and the other FQHCs. And, and Vanessa, I want to thank you for underscoring how how much this this impacts real real people with real real dynamic lives. And I think sometimes in the um, academic discussion of this, we we miss that sometimes. And um, and and the complexity um, of of people's lives. And um, and you know, as you were as you were saying, um, you know, really having like a long conversation about the the health of the individual. And you know, one of the things that that is also important, I think, for um, when we're talking about about this and Roe, you know, being overturned, is that Wisconsin's law um, would also include people who may be experiencing non-viable pregnancies, and and so so when you know Vanessa and and your team um, or any of the other FQHCs or any of the other healthcare providers um, are having those conversations and are are you know um, understanding what is happening with a person's pregnancy and 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 re and and understanding it is now a non-viable pregnancy or somebody presents in an emergent way and it's unclear if the pregnancy is viable um, or not. Um, it puts people in a really really dangerous, a really really dangerous situation, a a an incredibly physically dangerous situation. And it puts doctors in in an incredibly legally precarious situation, um, and and I think it's it's really important that that people understand that 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 it that that the law that we have on the books is is as restrictive as any law could be, um, and and so it 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 impacts really all all aspects of a pregnant person's reality. Um, and and so I, I I just I just wanted to make sure to put that into the room that um, that, that that that's real and it, and there's it's just terrible. I mean I don't want to say it's terrible. It's awful and it, and it, and it's and it's it's gonna be devastating to people and um, and it's and and I look at this virtual room and so incredibly grateful for all all of you and everybody who's listening in because I know there's a lot of people who's who are listening in who are very very deeply committed committed to this and and watching um, watching the movie um, uh, knowing that change is possible um, and and with um, I, I won't go into the gerrymandering representative Subek at this point but um, but change is possible um, when when we when we do work together and I don't mean to sound like a Pollyanna because it's a long road ahead um, and at the same time, um, I, I see this group here and, and the folks listening in um, and just have such extreme gratitude um, for um, for how we how we approach this work uh, together and with um, with, a, with a deep passion. So thank you. You, without even realizing it, segued me so beautifully because um, one of the things that I think really struck me from watching the film is there's a conversation where they mentioned that the real debate is going to be happening at dinner tables, in the pub, in the church. Um, and I think that from young ages, we're taught not to talk about money, politics, or religion, and abortion. And I think healthcare in general really finds that trifecta and runs with it. So those conversations are really hard. So I would ask you all, what, what do you suggest people when we are talking to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, talk about when we are talking about creating accessible and affordable health care broadly, um, and especially, I think, care for um, women and underserved populations in general. We need to be at the table. That's number one. The people that you're talking about, they need to be at the table. There should not be one room where you're talking about women and women aren't there or any type of legislation and women aren't there. Or if you're talking about marginalized communities of people of color and there's no one, uh, not, not just one, but multiple people of color in the room at the table helping make, in the, make those decisions. Um, it's just really absurd to me and, and absurd to me that, that 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 even happens, that it even exists, that you have um, that much control or power over someone else's lives without their input. 
how absurd is that? And so definitely, you know, representation, representation is huge and needed. Um, and it, it should be mandatory. It should, it, you know, it, it just 2022 and we still can walk into spaces or I can still walk into spaces as being a registered nurse for over 15 years now um, where I'm the only one. You know, and, and, and it, it's 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 not right. And so definitely, you know, I encourage everyone who has um, a voice of, of concern or compassion when you are at these tables and you look around the room and there's no one there that's representative of the people that you're talking about, you know, see what you can do to shift that. You know, there are so many people in the community that are doing this work and and our voices aren't seen, we aren't supported. Um, but we still need to do the work. We still need to show up. And um, so representation, I think, is, is the biggest thing to, to keep at the forefront that we need, we need to be there. Interestingly, you asked a little bit about, you touched also on the um, piece about sort of those dinner table conversations and community conversations and, you know, not so much the decision maker conversations, which are so such a big piece of my world, right? But I, um, it's interesting when you say that because I think about early on how I approached those kinds of conversations when I was talking to somebody who disagreed with me and I was going to convince them. And I was convinced that I was going to convince them and I was going to tell them the biggest, best story that was going to convince them. I was going to give them all the facts and it was going to convince them. And in my experience, um, and I work in a challenging environment with people who disagree with me in polar, polarized disagreement, right? And what I have found is that it is far more effective to find the common ground first and then go from there. And I'm probably, if somebody is adamantly 100% against abortion in any circumstance, I'm probably not going to sit down and have a conversation and change their mind. Um, changing someone's mind happens in a much bigger, greater way, right? You know, you can't just change somebody's mind through a conversation on major, particularly things that get at your core values. But you find where your core values mesh and you try to build from there. And it takes me back to things that I learned working in case management, you build on strengths, you build on commonalities, you don't find the deficit and simply say, we're gonna fix that. And I think that that can help guide the kind of work that we're talking about when you talk about how do you have those conversations? How do you sit down with somebody and have that conversation? Start by listening. You might find that they, you know, I find often somebody will say, oh, I'm against abortion. But when you start, having more of a conversation what you start to hear from them is that they're uncomfortable with abortion or they support abortion in some circumstances but maybe not in others and you find you find where you can meet and then I think you can work from there and build from there and find more commonality and unfortunately none of that's a fast process and we're sort of in this moment in time where everything feels so damn urgent, right? Like it's all now, we need change now, we need to do this now. And I, I just don't think that things happen that quickly when it comes to sort of those bigger changes. It does happen in time, but we urgently need to do the work. We urgently need to have those conversations. We urgently need to be part of those conversations in order to get to the point where we're making that longer term change. So I don't know if that really gets at what you were asking there, but it's something that just in my own experience, um, you know, I, I'm i quick to think that I know what's right and I'm going to convince somebody of that. Um, and I, you know, sort of come to realize that that doesn't, that's not a successful way to make change. Making change really requires um, a different approach and a more a more realistic and more genuine approach, probably, and really a more respectful approach. I really agree with what Vanessa and Lisa both shared, and I would add that one of the most um, powerful facts you can share with someone who's considering, you know, maybe they're in the middle of the road in terms of figuring out what they believe about abortion. Um, the stat that 60% of people who have abortions are already parents is something that I always try to include in those conversations. And I just think that's so powerful. Um, I really want to emphasize to folks that um, 
Bodily autonomy really matters. A lack of government intrusion in our most personal decisions, that matters and that's an effective communication framework as well. And abortion is a deeply personal decision. It is part of the full spectrum of reproductive health care. People have abortions for unwanted pregnancies as well as wanted pregnancies in those terrible cases of fatal fetal anomalies and other situations where someone's life is truly at risk. And we just have to have policies in place that are based on the real world in which even if we don't want them, even if some folks in power don't want people to get abortions, they're still gonna try to get abortions. So we should make that as safe and as legal and as accessible as possible. I I um certainly agree with what what everyone has said and and I think that you know knowing that nationally 80% of people believe abortion should be should remain safe and legal um e even if we have nuances of how we feel about it it is it's a complex issue it's a very deeply personal issue um and most Americans like the vast 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 majority of Americans understand the consequences of not having safe and legal abortion. Um, and, and so, you know, going into most conversations, understanding, I mean, I think listening is, is absolutely key. Um, and also knowing that you have an 80% chance of having, um, having some, um, some ability to, to have that conversation, um, you know, hopefully em emboldens people um, to have more of those conversations. Um, and, and, you know, something that, that Vanessa said, um, you know, really struck me about being at the table and, um, and, and when we are, you know, having conversations and, and particularly when, you know, we, we may be in a, a, a position where we are having a conversation from a place of privilege. Um, I think it's really important for, for, for us, um, to, engage and have conversations in a way where we can reach a shared understanding that when we focus our healthcare programs, our healthcare efforts, our healthcare resources on the individuals and communities that are experiencing the most health inequities, that is that is healthy for all, that is healthy for everybody. And that lifts that lifts that lifts all boats. That makes for a, a healthier Wisconsin. That makes for a healthier United States. Um, in in addition to the very basic, it's the right thing to do. Um, that that and that that is that that is where, if we invest our energy, our time, our resources, um, um, that 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 is that that is that is that is critical to to long long term change individual health and community and public health um and so when we are in these conversations i, I just I, I feel like you know there there's a there's a responsibility um to you know to engage our colleagues and peers um you know in that way yeah, I think that's a huge conversation that I see come up over and over again in discussions about, um, you know, again, to the point that was made earlier, no matter what, people are going to be receiving abortions, but how do we make them safe, legal, accessible, and affordable? And if we really cared about this issue, we would be investing in other resources. So I would love to hear from you all if you have thoughts on what else in this reproductive justice health space where could we be putting those resources instead to really actually help folks as they are determining what their family planning would look like? Can, can I ask a clarifying question, um, Molly? When, uh, when you say instead, um, investing in those resources instead, instead of just, just so I can understand the question. I um, probably picked poor language. I just mostly mean like where, where could we, I often encounter folks who say that, you know, we're doing this for the child, we're doing this for what have you, right? And the language is questionable. Um, but maybe instead of that, like what, what could we be doing as a community 
to really teach about reproductive health care, reproductive justice spaces, and what resources would be useful for folks as they are doing family planning. So not instead of, but in addition to is maybe better. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I think people need to really start being honest, having honest conversations about reproductive health as a whole. You know, I and starting young, you know, start with the, the youth about, you know, talking about reproductive health and what that means and, and, and when these changes start. Um, because we have so many people who come into our, our clinic spaces who are maybe pregnant or um, even wanting to, to have a baby and they have no clue about just their body and they can't tell me what a cervix is or a, a uterus or anything. And it's, it's, and so really having honest conversations about, you know, I don't know if people think like pregnancy is just all, you know, peaches and roses or what, but it is hard and it's complicated. Right. And so, um, Samantha, you talked about the, the, um, the the ab, the medical anomalies or the ab, genetic abnormalities you the maternal health conditions that can impact you know outcomes um the the emergencies that can happen you know we we've we had you know examples where you know you have a a family who already have like six children under the age of five and the mom is pregnant and um now there's a mass growing and what is it right and what happens if it, if it is the C word and what decisions can we make or what are, are the options? And a lot of times in some of those cases, it's, it's not favorable. And, and um, there are hard decisions that have to be made. And I don't think people are understanding the complexities of it all. And we really, you know, bringing people together so that we can share these stories from a medical profession, professional side um, and the families who are going through it, the emotional toll, the psychological impact of these decisions. Um, I think, you know, someone said that there are um, abortions, whether, you know, you, you have children or they're, they're wanted pregnancies and unwanted. And so the psychological impact of that is huge for both. And so really having these honest conversations with, you know, those making these decisions on, on, on the health and outcomes of others, so you can see that no, everyone doesn't have a smooth nine month pregnancy where they're just, you know, oh, I'm craving oranges and I can, that's it. That's the only worry I have about pregnancy. Like there's a lot to, that goes into it. And I just don't think that the stories are being shared. And so I know Ex Fabula did a um, a birth story um, run one, at one point where they were inviting people in to tell their birth stories and, and their experiences. And um, from, from even the father's perspective, um, and, and it's just overwhelming for so many people. And so sharing those stories and even, you know, having those conversations for those who chose not to, and this is my why, and being supported by people who can, can hold their hand while they share those stories. So it's not so taboo. Like there are complicated decisions behind these processes. I'm just not a horrible person because I made this decision. Right. And so, um, there's a, a lot. And I think, people are clueless to what the struggles of people, you know, are that, that have, are put in these situations. Um, even if they're again, choosing to continue a pregnancy where there are so many complications there that it's like, wow, how are you, how are you going to do this? And I think, um, so there's, there's those conversations, but then there's also, okay, well, if you choose not to, there's still, you need to be supported again, the psychological toll that, that will occur. It's not if it will occur, it will occur. So having support groups um, for for those who make that decision and then for those who are kind of on the fence and they choose to to continue on with the pregnancy, but really they're probably like depressed the entire pregnancy. And we know just from a, a genetic standpoint that stress from that the mother is experiencing can impact the outcome of the 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 the, the delivery and just the genetic genetic makeup and um, predisposition of the the newborn and so um, trying to find support for people who might want might have chosen to go another route but they might have been peer pressure whether it's religion or family input or um, whatever they chose to continue but then they're having psychological issues behind that. And so 
just conversations. We need more real, raw, honest conversations and bringing people to, to the table um, and people to be vulnerable enough to share that and feel supported in doing so. So I guess I would add, looking outside of the abortion realm, that the decision whether or not to become a parent, whether or not to start a family, we talk about that as a deeply personal, personal decision, but that revolves around so much more than abortion. Abortion is the piece that may come into play when somebody is already pregnant. Um, there are critical act issues around access to birth control, around actually making thoughtful family planning decisions, you know, and recognizing um, recognizing who, who and how you can get help in making those decisions. Um, certainly um, education is a piece of this and starting at a young age. I can remember working with teen, with teen moms who didn't know things when they got pregnant and didn't know that that was going to be a risk that they were taking because they didn't have the education to understand how the action they were taking actually put them in a position where they could get pregnant. Some of them were told things by their partners that were just flat out not true about why they couldn't get pregnant in this particular situation or another, right? And so comprehensive sex education goes a long way, not just in school, but also making sure that youth have the resources, that they know how to protect themselves, that they have access to the tools they need to protect themselves, that they don't have to have the money to walk into a store and buy a condom, right? Or they don't have to go through the experience if they're not comfortable doing that. Um, that they actually have access to that, that they have access to prescription birth control. Um, ensuring that our schools stop teaching abstinence-only education, and we do have schools in the state who are teaching abstinence-only education. Back a number of years ago, I think it was, and Tanya might remember the year better than I was, I think it was 2009, 2008, somewhere in there, um, to 2010, Wisconsin passed a comprehensive sex education bill that would require any school that taught sex education teach comprehensive, age-appropriate, medically accurate education, include information about contraception, and that got rolled back less than two years later, it got repealed. Um, so we have schools that are still teaching abstinence as the only option, and we know that that's not an effective way to teach young people how to protect themselves. And even if they don't have sex, then they are going to at some point and don't they need that information and those tools. And so, you know, I think that we need to remember that when you're making a decision about whether or not to become a parent, I think often um, people, people think about abortion because they think about that moment in the decision-making framework, but that decision-making frame framework can start much sooner. There will always be a need for abortion. Um, there will always be a need for people to have access to safe, um, legal abortion care. However, there are times where a decision could be made sooner that would prevent the, the need um, for an individual to seek an abortion. And so providing those resources is really critical and providing resources for people who choose to have a family, ensuring that you don't have to, you don't have to be rich or you don't have to be at some particular financial level to choose to have children. Um, you know, your income should not decide whether or not you can or should be a parent. You should have the resources you need. Ensuring that moms, when they return to work, um, are able to continue breastfeeding. And that the rules that their employer sets forward or obstacles in the workplace don't keep them from being able to do that. And I could go kind of on and on with some of those barriers. Obviously, paid family leave is a huge piece of it. We are, we are behind the rest of the world on that. I mean, the idea, I, I think about my child care days and, you know, parents who would come to us and say, you know, my child's only four weeks old, but I have to get back to work. I'm like, we can't take a four-year-old baby. Um, and, you know, th they should never be in the position of having to feel that way. But economically, that's where some families are. And, you know, paid family leave, access to affordable child care. People pay, people pay a college tuition worth in child care for their children. You know, it costs as much as college tuition. You know, I can, again, I can go on and on with policies. But, you know, I think it, what we need to do, if you want to put it sort of in the broad terms, is we need to think of that whole spectrum. What does it mean to make decisions about 
starting a family and how do we support people, whether they are choosing not to start a family or to start a family. That's the two of you together it was fantastic. I love it. Um, so I know that we're very close to time. So I, I'm just going to have you last question, last thought. What would you tell folks who may be watching this, who may be um, angry or scared or lost right now? And what would you leave them with at the end of this? Those feelings are so valid. And I think a lot of us are feeling that way right now. And I think one important way to contribute is just to um, get out in the streets if you're up for it, speaking as a private citizen, and um, to share information on medication abortion resources, because that's one of the biggest information gaps out there right now. I would say, you know, I, I can tell you I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm concerned. Um, I think we're all feeling it. I guess that um, what I would think that, you know, there's lots of different ways that people can react to that, but I would say take action, channel that, right? Use that um, to come together collectively with others. We are more powerful together than we are as one. There are lots of organizations, Planned Parenthood among them, but there are a number of others as well that are organizing that give you avenues to get involved. Heck, there's an election coming up, you know, you don't only have to vote, think about running for office. Um, folks have till June 1st to submit their nomination papers if they want to run for office. I'm happy if somebody thinks that's the way that they wanna go, I'm happy to talk to them, happy to help them through that process. I think, you know, that's sometimes how people get there, but otherwise figure out how do you, how do you volunteer in your community? How do you, um, when the time comes, help make sure everybody has access, figure out where you can channel that energy and go with it. Because um, we, we do have voices. We aren't voiceless. We aren't powerless. Even when really awful things happen, if we sit silently, we've lost, we've lost. If we stand up and fight and do everything in our power to make change, that's how we win in the long run. I agree. We need to demand that our elected officials take the politics out of sexual and reproductive and maternal and, and birth parent health and, and make that an expected public health investment. This is the, the, these um, birth parent health, uh, maternal health, uh, reproductive health, the abortion, um, you know, the overturn of Roe that's in front of us right now. Um, this is so much about power and so much about control. And um, it's important that people be able to have their own agency and their own power and their own control over their own healthcare decisions. And, and, and for our uh, political uh, machine to stop using us and um, our communities as, as, a, as a political wedge. Um, and so we need to demand that of them. We need to, in this moment, um, pick up the phone and demand that our state legislature repeal the criminal abortion ban, support Representative Subek's um, legislation. Uh, and, and I understand, I'm not naive about what our legislature looks like. They still have a job to do. They still represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. They should not get off the hook because they are gerrymandered and, and whatever else they are. They don't, they don't get to be let off the hook. They have a job and they need to do it. And, and we, we in this moment need to demand that they do it. Um, I'll just add on from a doula perspective. Um, there are doulas for the entire reproductive spectrum, you know, um, reproductive and beyond actually. Um, there's even, you know, there's, there's hospice end of life doulas. Um, there's birth doulas, there's postpartum doulas, there's abor abortion doulas, there's, you know, all of the above and below. And, um, you know, there's support, you know, if they're, if you're lost on and angry on where to go and, and, and who to talk to, you know, reach out, use your resources. Um, we definitely can point you in the right direction. 
um, whether you want to get involved from a legislative standpoint or um, a grassroots community standpoint, um, reach out to those who are doing the work and we can, we can support you in whatever way we can. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your time, your expertise, your incredible, incredible dialogue this evening. Um, we really appreciate that and are grateful for it. Um, obviously, the conversation will not stop here. And I, again, would say that if you want to watch The Eighth, which deals with Ireland's repeal of the Eighth Amendment, check it out on watch.mke.org. We have a couple of days left of the festival. Otherwise, find these incredible folks and people like them doing the work in your community. And thank you all so much for showing up and giving your time and your energy. Have a good evening, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, Molly.